type of technical error. Um, we, we didn't do the reading for today, um, but we're just going to read this verse, this part of Isaac Ambrose looking, setting our eyes to Jesus. And also, um, if you guys want to, it's there's a very simple read of practicing presence with God. And uh, this talks about how we look to Jesus and the way that we look to Jesus is just like what David said, um, you know, knowing that he's God, knowing that he's a God that wants us to be, you know, we would think he wants us to be comfort and rejoicing in him and be content, but that's, that's what he wants. But what he wants more is we'll be joyful and content and praising him in suffering not in just comfort times and you know that's what that's why we need to in the comfortable times like now we need to praise jesus and we need to see and practice and have the disciplines of faith and that's how we look to jesus is that we can look to his wounds to his wounds that he's endured for us to on the cross the sides that have pierced through we can look at him suffering on the cross for six hours if you just sit and look at bible at john 19 just sit with it seeing how how long he endured the cross that would change you and you know we have to continue to talk to him right because he died and he's now on the right hand of god and you know it's it's out of your own um how do you say this it's out of our own you know compulsion of you know christ is always be with us because he said in matthew I don't know if I'm screen sharing, but he did say in um, Matthew, sorry, that's right here. Um, he did say in Matthew about how we should focus on him. He did say about, you know, Matthew 28, behold, I'm with you always. And we need to look our eyes, set our eyes on Jesus because he said, I am with you always at the end of age, because he has risen with the Father. So as um, you know, David, Ryan, you guys are looking at this, and also um, we would look at how we look to Christ daily. And from Isaac Ambrose, this could load. There's a lot of technical issue today, okay. Looking into Jesus or the soul's eyeing of Jesus, the great work of man's salvation. Amongst all the duty I formerly mentioned, I am omitted one that I looked upon as chief and choice of the rest. This is the duty I call looking unto Jesus. And if I must discover the occasion of my falling on it, failing on it, I should do it truly and plainly. And one of the ways that we mentioned is we can look to Christ by just seeing how he suffered for us, seeing what's um, what he suffered for our sins um, on the cross. He was enduring the, right? We went through Hebrews 12 this morning, Hebrews 12 and 11, right? How we not be weary is that we consider how much Christ could have suffered from the scorning of man. And he said, you know, we, we went through here and we talked about Okay, um, if we continue to read here, we see that 
God is saying, you know, he would discipline us and consider him who endures sinners such hostility against himself so that you might not grow weary or faint-hearted. Why? Like, why? You know, why? So, Hebrews 12, 3, John 3. So, Calvin quoted it pretty good. That we don't burden ourselves when we look to Christ. We don't burden ourselves daily with whatever it is. Maybe a video game, maybe checking on a phone or, or texting people that you thought you should. And we look to him. We care, we cast off the lust of the flesh, worldly cares, riches and honors, other things that kind. And we looked and run after Christ. And uh, we look at this and we look at how much, how much, we see him have joy running after the death of the cross, right? If the son of man, son of God, whom it behaves all to adore willingly undergo such severe conflicts, who of us shall dare to submit with him the same? If he died with us, died for us, why won't we serve him? Why won't we go through the same suffering, right? And that's why we bear the cross and take care of each other because Christ had died for us. For this one thought alone ought to be sufficient to conquer all temptation. Lord Jesus have done this. He have spent time with the tax collector and the prostitute and all those people, and he have not sinned. He did not hate them. He did not lust after them. He just served. He just, he didn't do, you know, he just shared the scripture. That's all he did. And um, that is, we know that we are companions or associates of the Son of God, and that He, who was so far above us, willing to come down to our condition in order that He might animate us, He might stir us up to have good works, to, to do it by His own example, to fight good. And this we gather courage. And there's, sorry, I constantly get sidetracked, but. Um, Looking to Jesus, and if my, I must discover the occasion of my falling on it, I should do it truly and plainly. In spring 1653, I was visited by sore sickness, and the Lord began to restore my health. It came into my thoughts what Jesus had done for my soul. All right, let's meditate a little bit about what Jesus had done for our souls. Lord, thank you. You have saved my soul from eternity in hell, burning with worm eating of my flesh that doesn't die. And Lord, we thank you for you who died for us, who show us how to live. And Lord, we thank you for, he, for being God that hear prayer. Christ, I'm praying. And what he was doing and what he would do for it till he saved it to the mother uttermost. My conception, like... um. Here's something we can think about is what is Jesus doing in your life right now? And how is he being your Lord in your life? In my conception of these things, I could find no beginning of his actings, but in that eternity before the world was made, nor could I find any end of his actings. But in that eternity after the world should be unmade, only betwixt these two extremities, I apprehend various transactions of Lord Jesus Christ, both past, present, and to come. Right? What have he done in the past? What is he doing right now? He's helping us to hate sin and, and repent and turn back to him. What is he going to do? Right? If you read, read Revelation, he's going to come and judge the nation. He's going to come and free the captives, the, the one who trusted in him are going to give them a new name, a new body. He's going to raise them up from the grave and go to heaven with him. So that's what I believe, what is going to happen. And that's what God said in his word, the Protestant Bible. Because, you know, all other Bibles, all the Catholic Bible, you know, the you know, Muslim, Torah, the, you know, Jehovah's Witness, Mormon Bible, they're not 
real because if God is holy and God is holy, because why? Because you always think of what we are created to think is that there will be people who do bad things who go to hell, people who do good things and follow God who go to heaven, right? And the fact is all who sin against God go to hell and all who follow God and believe in Christ go to heaven. You know, no matter what they did, the last shall be the first, right? If they believe and follow, deny themselves and follow Christ, no matter what they do in the past, they will be forgiven. It's God's election, right? And so that's what he would do. And the multitude of these thoughts in me, my soul exceedingly delighted itself, right? When we think about these, think about things above, but what is to come, it's that God would judge the nations and then he will come down and conform us to the image of Christ for those who have faith and trust in him. That is great. That's better than anything. That's that thought alone excites us to put our faith in Christ and continue in faith. That is a good thought. That is a, a thought that is from above. And that's what we should think about. In the multitude of thoughts in me, my soul exceeded delight himself. And that delight stirring up me other affection, I began to consider those texts in the scripture, which seemed to impose the working of my affection. So blessed an object as gospel duty. Then I resolved if the Lord Jesus would, but restore my health, but to prolong my life, I would endeavor to discover more of this gospel duty than ever yet I knew, and that my pains herein might not hinder my necessary labors. My purpose was to fall on the subject of my ordinary preaching, wherein I might have occasion to both search and do scripture, several offer, and my own heart. In process of time, I began to work, begging of God that he would help me to finish, as he inclined me to begin and all that might tend to his glory and the church's good. In the pro progress of my labor, I found a world of spiritual comfort, both in respect to the object that I handled, Jesus Christ, and in respect of the act wherein consisted my duty to him in looking unto Jesus. For the object that was very subject that I was bound to preach, Christ in you, the hope of glory, says Paul in Colossians. And immediately he adds, whom preach, Colossians 1, 27, 28. So let's go to that. And um, we might have to go soon, and uh, but I promise we'll continue this tomorrow, hopefully. Hopefully, maybe next week, David will join us, but maybe tomorrow we can do it with Brian, someone. So we'll, we'll see. But, um, 17. And whatever you do in word of deed, do everything in the name of Lord Jesus, giving, thanking God to the Father in him. And how does that tie into 117 for 18? And before all things, and in him, he had all things together. And he's the head of the body of the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Okay, so that's what it is. That's what it is that he is the king of all kings, that he hold all things together. Unto me, who is the least of the saints, this grace is given. What is grace that I should preach among Gentiles, the unsearchable riches of Christ? Right, this grace, this undeserving favor, when Paul was sinning against God, who was killing people out of the Judaism, right? Those who follow Christ, those who confess Jesus as God. And now, he come to serve the living God. Now he gets to see the grace of Christ. Now he got entirely changed by Christ dying for him on the cross, by, by all the works of Christ, by, by influenced by Christ and changed by the Holy Spirit, as we call. And he go back to, you know, Ephesians 3.8. So that's what Christ did to me. To me, the least of saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So as we end today, what are the unsearchable riches of Christ to you today? What are things, name 10 things, list it out on the list, 10 things you're grateful of, and just name three things and share it with people around you what you're thankful of. And until next time, fixing our eyes to Jesus. Let's look to Jesus 
and run with a race and endurance and cast off every sin and hold on his name very tight and behold him on the cross for us. Let's see you guys next time.